Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to be working with a song entitled The Shadow of Your Smile that, as you can see, is presented as a lead sheet. In other words, we've got a melody, um, it happens to be a vocal melody but I'm not worried about the words here, and then we've got chords indicated across the top of the lead sheet. And we're really going to think about, well, what are these chords and how can we play this so it sounds like a really good interpretation of the score rather than just someone plonking some chords down. Now, if you're not quite so sure about the detail of what's going on with a lead sheet, we've got other videos on the channel that explain how to deal with that, how to read a lead sheet, what the chord symbols mean and all the rest of it, which you may want to have a little look at before we get too involved in this one. If you're familiar with how it works, then you'll probably be quite happy sticking with us. Now, the way a lot of people read a lead sheet is that they play the tune in the right hand and then they just plonk down the chords in the left hand. Well, it's all right it will get you somewhere, but would it sound like the best possible solution? So let me just try playing a bit of this song on that basis. I'm going to play the tune in the right hand and I'm going to put some chords down in the left hand, reading them off the lead sheet. So there's the first eight bars. And I've played all the chords as they're written on the lead sheet. But does it sound good? Not really. So why doesn't it sound good? If I'm playing the melody in the right hand, as it says in the music, and I'm playing the chords in the left hand, surely it's going to sound good. Well, you've got some difficulties, haven't you? One difficulty is if you get lots of notes close together in the left hand, it starts to sound very kind of thick and muddy. And the lower your left hand is, the worse it gets. So, you know, if I play this F sharp seven chord there, it's pretty thick. If I played it an octave lower, it would be, what are these notes? You can hardly make them out. So the lower you get and the closer the notes get together and the more notes you've got piled up in the left hand close together, you're going to get this kind of thick, muddy sound. And then the left hand also sounds completely disconnected from the right hand melody. There doesn't seem to be any interaction going on between the hands, does there? And often when we're thinking about writing music and we're working maybe in four different parts, instead of thinking, well, here's a tune up here and then I've got three parts or more going on down here, Actually, quite often we think of it the other way around. You know, here's, here's the tune at the top, and maybe I've got three parts in the right hand and just one in the left hand. And that will always sound better because if you get more notes into your right hand, they'll be higher up and you can cope with notes being close together. You know, take that first chord, that F sharp seven chord. If I play it really low, it's kind of indistinct, isn't it? Bring it up an octave. Still a bit thick, but it's better. Bring it up another octave. Oh, suddenly you hear the difference in the clarity of that. It's massive. Bring it up another octave. It's really clear now, isn't it? So you see what happens. If I can get some of these chords into the right hand, then we're going to get rid of that kind of thick, muddy sound. And we're also going to get rid of the fact that this melody sounds totally separated from what's going on down below. So then you can just have a bass line at the bottom. Now, if you have a separation of bigger space between right hand and chords and the bass line, that's going to sound an awful lot better than the other way around. So if I play that first chord, that F sharp seven chord, and I have the, the C sharp melody note in my right hand, and I put a chord underneath it, bit thick, octave lower, really horribly thick, but if I put the F sharp seven chord in the right hand and just have one note in the left hand, the F sharp, that chord is much cleaner. Or put it down an octave, it's a much better sound, isn't it? So let's see what happens if I try to play this first eight bars again, but this time I just kind of have a bass note in the left hand and I put the chord into the right hand. It will go something like this.
Now, do you hear? That's so much cleaner, isn't it? It still doesn't sound great, but it's much cleaner than it was to have that kind of organization. And I think that's quite a good way to go about this. So stage one is, can you find the chords? And maybe do that thing where you play the tune in the right hand, you just try to find the chords in the left hand. Stage two is then to say, can I redistribute the chords so I try to get the chords in the right hand underneath the melody. It's harder to do because you've got to play the melody and slip the chords in underneath it as well, but get the bass line in the left hand. From there, stage three might be to say, well, once I've got a feel for that, I might be able to do a bit of both. Okay, so some notes in the left hand, some notes in the right hand, but thinking about your left hand, having notes that are not too close together. So maybe we have two notes in the left hand, but we've got more notes in the right hand or something. And um, some of the time we might just have one note in the left hand. Sometimes we, we might have two, even three sometimes possible, but spread it between the hands. So we might do something like this then. So what have I done there? I've used the bass line at the bottom of my left hand, but sometimes I've just had the bass, sometimes I've had another note, maybe an octave higher or a seventh higher or something like that. Sometimes quite widely spaced, just occasionally I've had the notes a bit closer together. And I've also tried to make a little bit of variety. So sometimes I've just got four parts in a chord, sometimes maybe just three. Sometimes I've let the chord thicken out a bit, so I've got five or six parts in it, because that gives us a little bit of variety as well. So we haven't always got a kind of uniform approach to how many notes are sounding at the same time. So it's kind of working out, can we read the chords fluently? You need to get good at doing that. So right hand on the melody, left hand, get the chords going. Then try this trick of getting the chords into the right hand underneath the melody, really deliver the bass in the left hand. Then from there, do something that's a bit in between, but always thinking about the spacing of the chords so we get that really good. And then from that point, once you get happy with that, it's then what can we do to improve the rhythmic flow of it? Because this is never going to sound good if we're just plonking down a chord every time we see a chord symbol. It's only going to really flow if we can get a bit of movement into the rhythm as well without losing, in this case, the fact that we've got four beats in every bar. Because this is what I find happens here. As soon as people start trying to put some rhythm in, they start adding beats onto notes in the melody or something goes wrong in the rhythm. So you've got to keep thinking when you put some rhythmic flow into it, some what we call figuration, then you've got to keep your four beats in the bar going. So what do I mean by this? Well, I think in a song like this in particular, it's a bit of a, a sort of gift in a way as to what to do when. Sometimes the melody is moving quite quickly. It's going in in quavers or eighth notes, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. Um, and so when the melody is moving, actually you don't need to do so much in the accompanying stuff. But then we get these long notes in the melody where we're just sitting somewhere for three beats. Well, do we want the chord just to sit there for three beats? Or do we want the chord to move while the melody is sitting still? So when the melody moves, you might think the chords don't need to move. When the melody's more kind of sedentary, well, you might get some more movement going in the accompanying material. So that's the next stage. I would say, you know, work on this chord spacing, chord distribution stuff, you know, use your ears, think, is that a good sound? Is it a bit thick, a bit congested, too low down? Can I re-space the chords? You know, get happy with all that kind of stuff. And then you can move on to this bit, which is really kind of putting the icing on the cake, if you like. You know, if you get your chord distribution sorted out and you're playing the right chords, where well, you've made the cake well, now we're gonna try and ice the cake. And this is gonna to help to really put a little bit of spin onto this thing and make it sound more musical. So if we're gonna get the chords moving, well, how do we do that? Well, one thing you can do is just spread out the chord. You can 
arpeggiate the chord. You can use some kind of broken chord figure. So if I'm going to use this F7, sorry, F sharp 7 in the first bar, well, the second bar of music, but the first chord we see, that's my chord, but I've got three beats in the song. So what can I do with that? Because I don't really want to go. Can I punch a bit of rhythm into that or break up the chord a bit? See, all I've done there is take the chord, the F7 chord, and I've just started on the bottom and kind of arpeggiated up. So you see how that goes? So just breaking up a chord, you don't have to do anything cleverer than that. Um, you can do things like you can move the bass line and you can use inessential notes or non-chord tone. So you could have a passing tone, for example, a passing note. Something like that. Do you see what I've done there? I've started with the F sharp in the bass and then I've passed through G sharp, which doesn't belong to the chord, on the way to A sharp. So that G sharp is just a passing note or a passing tone. And just by putting a little bit of rhythm into it, it's just kind of spruced it up. Now, you may be happy to do that kind of stuff, or you may think, oh no, just uh, arpeggiating a chord, breaking up a chord's enough for me for now. But eventually you'll be able to do a little bit of both. There are even times when you can use a bit more artistic license and think, am I happy with the chord that's there or can I spruce it up a little bit? What do I mean by that? Well, we get a B7 chord, don't we, in bar three? So there's a B7 chord. You've got a C natural coming in the melody, which is a flat ninth. So you could go for B7 and then go on to that. Or you could say, well, why don't I put that flat nine in the chord? do something like that. And you see what I'm doing with that B7? I'm just trying to do different things with a um, bit of rhythm in it. So in this case, I put my B7 down or my B flat nine in the right hand, and I've just got one note in the bass, the B, but then I've gone B, F sharp, B. And do you see what it does? Just gives us a bit of rhythm. I can just repeat the chord in the right hand. One, two, three, See how that just gives us a bit of rhythm, a bit of rhythmic drive, because the left hand's going dotted, and then just to give us a little bit of punch. You see, and just by repeating that chord in the right hand. something's happening. So we're not just sitting on B7 while the melody is sitting there going nowhere as well, because these long notes are going to need a bit of movement. It's one reason why I chose this song. I thought it illustrates that well. When you come to the E minor chord in bar four, well, there's nothing wrong with just having an E minor chord. That's absolutely fine. And again, you could do the same thing. You can arpeggiate the chord. Maybe have a little passing note or a passing tone like I've just done there. So I've come up the chord E, B, E, then F sharp as a passing note onto G. So you could do that. Or you could say, well, could I just add something to the E minor chord? Can I can I add a sort of sus2 or something? something like that or you could do something kind of a bit more juicy like I could have the E minor chord but with an F sharp and then F sharp E D C sharp that uh, takes me on to the A7 chord so you kind of get something that's almost beginning to be a little bit of a counter melody that just floats into the middle of the texture somewhere you see how I did that And it kind of links you into the next part of what the what the melody is doing. So just by breaking up the chords, arpeggiating things, putting a bit of rhythm in the bass, using a few of these non-chord tones or what we call inessential notes, um, just helps to kind of add some style to the whole thing, which makes the accompaniment kind of integrate with the melody. 
and it just keeps that sense of things moving all the time. It may be there are times when you just want to be still on a note and just enjoy that for a moment, but you don't want the whole song to be kind of stopping every time there's a three beat note or a four beat note because it's the kiss of death to the song, isn't it really? And then, you know, you kind of feel where there's a bit more harmonic tension going on in the song and you can find, well, is there a warmer way to play that chord? Is this a chord where I can have more notes or do something else with the way I've spread the notes out or the rhythm I've injected? just to kind of paint that, you know, towards the end of the song, for example, you know, when we come down to say bar 25, things just kind of hot up a bit, don't they? It's a nice warm sound, that A minor seven. In the left hand, what I'm doing for that A minor seven, I'm using A at the bottom, which is what you want at the bottom, then I'm using E and G, but I'm missing out that C because that C is gonna make it sound thick miss out that C, so I've got an A, upper fifth to E, and then a G. I can always put the C in the right hand because it's there anyway, isn't it, in the melody. And then a C minor, it's a warm sound, and then this F7. You see, that's a really warm sound, isn't it? So you see how I'm kind of trying to do that, I'm just spreading that chord a bit in the left hand, F, C, a with an E flat and A and then the tune on the top. Just spacing out that chord and having a slightly thicker chord, six part chord, makes it really warm. And then the B minor seven could be a little bit closer, a bit more intimate. And then on we go. So it's kind of just getting a feel for where are the kind of tense moments in the harmony? How do I paint that in the number of chords that I use and in the way that I do it? And whatever you do, trying to get the mood of the song, you know, this is a kind of reflective song, isn't it? A kind of love song. And it's a gorgeous piece of writing actually. So you may decide you want to give it a new spin. That's absolutely fine. You can do that, punch a lot more rhythm into it, do whatever you want to do. If you want to just try to keep the original flavor of it, well, it's kind of a gentle approach that's needed and just kind of finding a way to keep the flow going, distribute the chords well, use some of this figuration of broken chords, arpeggiated things, using some non-chord tones, some inessential notes. It's amazing how you can then get to a point where actually it starts to sound a lot more classy. So um, this is not the last word in it, but let me try and play it to you, sort of taking on board the principles that we've just been thinking about. I think I might have missed out a line there, better it, don't mind. You got the ideas just to kind of try and demonstrate what we're doing here. So do you hear what I'm doing there? And then as you kind of make all that happen, you get this much more integrated approach. And then you can think about dynamics and then you can think about 
Am I going to play with the rhythm a little bit? You know, I was kind of playing that reasonably straight, but just starting to bend little corners of the rhythm. You know, things like the final chord, just spreading out and going up above the melody at the end. These are all ways in which you can just put the icing on the cake, to use that phrase. So I hope that's been a helpful few minutes just looking at working with the lead sheet, how to do it in such a way that we end up with what will be a pleasing musical result. So hope you enjoy playing music from a lead sheet.